go through it till you understand it. Um, what I would like to do today, the great term of the day, if you look at our, our calendar, is the flight of the heart song. The flight of the heart song is like the key that unlocks the high heart's gate. And, oh my gosh, last night was a little frustrating because I had to figure things out cerebrally. Normally I just get them. And last night I, I didn't have the exact words to explain what I was seeing. But it has given us such insights on the purpose of life. And I'm so grateful for anything that points to the purpose of life because it's easy for one to lose hope. Many people are feeling hopeless because it's what am I doing here? This doesn't work for me. I'm in a crazy place. You know, they me out of here, but where can they go? This is home. So we either claim our home back or we don't. And it helps when there is purpose behind what we have done. And we brought this up yesterday, so I have some good insights for us. So my loves, I would actually like to begin our day with the heart song. If you tell me, darling, don't go too far, okay? I'm gonna ask you to play something for us. I, I had a heart song this morning, and I wanted to understand how do we follow, what do we follow? into our inner space to get to know ourselves more. What is that highway in? And it is the heart song that is the final piece for us to be able to explore ourselves and, and what has been called the rich infrastructure within. To understand that, we need to get in there with the heart song. And so this morning, I wondered about heart song, and now she's She's speaking about this. She's giving me this that speaks about it. So if I tell you my heart song, I felt, I felt, um, I felt wobbly um, about something with China, about everything need to be on the phone with them. And, I have put hours and hours into the work, so I don't want things to not properly come together. So what happened is that I felt wobbly about it, and all of a sudden, it just didn't matter, because a song was singing through my being. And when a song calls, it's like a predominant, it's like a predominant musical piece. And then I actually ask, um, to once again this morning play a piece that's the resolution piece and ask you to find your heart sound during that. I'm going to tell you about the heart sound and that I found this morning. I was getting dressed after my, my Chinese conversation, I was a little discouraged. I was basically saying, listen, your pace is too fast for us. We cannot manage, we cannot keep up with you and we feel pressure. So we have to go slowly. And so what happened is suddenly I remembered a very special time, which really didn't seem special to the other people in the car, but we were driving as lecturing in South Africa, and we drove through a pass known as the Tourist Kruif, um, Kruif being um, a chasm in the mountain. And so we were driving through this pass, and these balloons came out of the mountain, and they were making this big display along the, the side of the road, jumping up and down, and you know, making me you know that they're the boss of this area. I better be very careful, because they're very strong big balloons. So I, the feeling of the balloons, of, and the, the feeling of, of Africa to begin with, you know. Simon and I always say, oh, thank God, we're not living in Africa anymore. But at the same time, it has a song that calls you. My son, for instance, he's smitten with Africa. And he calls me, he misses it when it's not there. I feel the same about Alaska as well. So the song of Africa is ancient and still. And the place you feel it is in the top of your chest. And I remember this ancient place um, the road had been built by Italian prisoners of war. 
that was sent to South Africa during the last World War. And they had actually built it. And I can just imagine how they missed their homes and how they just wanted to go home and eat mama's pasta. And here they are in South Africa, you know, up here on the rocky ledges building this pass. Some of them died doing that. It's dangerous work. Um, but the old feeling of it was something you cannot explain. It's an unexplainable something that it evoked within. This little tiny corner in Africa. And I, I remember that when I came up the other side of the bus, I was different. I looked at all the nice cave houses. Supposedly my ancestors built them. And, but they looked different than they looked when we went out in the other side. So, this feeling, I came up with something that it's wild and it's free and it's ancient and it speaks to a part of me that doesn't awaken normally. This is a heart song and it's speaking in inner, inner language, which is why I can't even explain to you why that experience stood out. I just knew that I had changed during that trip through the mountains and it was only a matter of by two hours through the mountains. Um, there are things in your life, like I also remember in, in Africa, going to visit the um, little Bushman tribe that lives there, and I never experienced such cold. I had six blankets on, and I put on every bit of clothing I had, and I was chilled to the bone. It seemed to pierce my clothing. And I thought of them, because they were only their little skins. I still don't even understand it. It's icy cold, but somehow the cold is just part of the earth and the wind, and, and, when, and by the next morning, I couldn't wait for the next morning. I couldn't wait to get in the car and have it turned on and be warm for a change. But I thought of the bushman and how really that the cold that, we, that I found so intolerable was just another day in paradise for them. The, the amazing, they took me to their rock formations where they'd gone to Vision Quest for a long, long time, and the little drawings that have been made there, thousands of years old. And I, the little children ran up because they liked my hair. And they tied a knot in my hair I couldn't untie. <laughs> like that, little fingers. And there I sit with a big knot, and I cannot do it. I can't even see how they did it. You know, the unique experience in the little house where I spent this cold, cold night. I could hear the baboons screaming as the leopards called them, and the favorite food of the le leopard. And then the next morning, they seemed to be extremely upset by the leopard. They came and they jumped on that roof of my house, and they were shaking everything they could shake about the little house that was in it. And, it was such a, a feeling of just emotion coming up, the frustration of not knowing when, which one of them the leopard's going to get next. And they took it out of my house. But this whole feeling, I have no words for it. I just know that it stirred something in my inner space that is not explainable on the outer space. And this morning, that song came back that was sung by the baboons and the bushmen and the little children and, and the cold and the, the desert and everything was suddenly in a song that changed me. I'm going to ask you to go back through your life, find moments that unexplainably changed your life. It could be that you're walking down the street and suddenly you don't see the city the same. You see it like the movie Orchestra Rush. You see the cans blowing and the bottles chinking and the, and the trash cans rattling as a symphony. And it's never the same again. Look for those moments. They won't have explanation. Just feel them and allow them yet again to reveal to you your inner space. That's what we're going to do first. We're going to do it to our resolution piece. But I had a little bit of business, and I keep forgetting this is our last day, because I normally teach here for a week. 
So um, let's do this. Um, there's three things I, I wanted to do this morning. One is just to tell you about upcoming retreats. We have our, our next retreat. I'm in Russia for most of November. And you're always welcome there because it's a phenomenal experience. I particularly recommend Mayoral Mountains because of the beautiful facility on the lake and also Siberia, which is wild and free and exquisite. Um, but Moscow is a short flight from Europe. And so um, we speak English, of course, and it gives you more time to internalize as the Russian translation takes place. Now, the first one coming up then is Russia. We are in Moscow, we're in Vaishni Novgorod. Mm -hmm. I say that correctly? I think I have the wrong letter in there. But um, that is in November. In December, in my house in Newport, and I have, um, I have four bedrooms in that house, and especially for people coming from overseas, if you let us know immediately, at least I am coming. If not, my husband as well. If not, maybe my kids as well. We have got very low up mattresses, so we can always accommodate everybody if we need to. But um, we don't include lodging, but it is just that it's there for you. If you let us know quickly and you're coming from overseas. Okay, this is the Christmas one. We have people here from, are you from France? And from Den Haag? Den Haag, right? Still there. Okay, the Hague. And um, who else has come from overseas? Who knows where Anastasia comes from? Darling, are there anybody else from overseas? Yes, sweetheart. Italy. Oh, my sister. Yeah. I am so delighted. And um, I already thought. Well, and you're soon going to be from Portugal. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so we've got, you know, especially if you're coming from overseas, we try and give you uh, a room in my house. I also own the little house across the street where I um, am with my family. That house, that big house is for you. And so that's in December for a week. It is a spectacular retreat, if I say so myself. We do Christmas present exchanges and we make Christmas cookies and we go singing and we have a big Christmas tree and we have a lot of fireside fun things at night. And then in the day, you know, of course we do our work. Newport is so beautiful. I go all over the world. I mean, Cape Town is pretty close, but this is one of the most beautiful places you will see. And we do do um, out of your trips. We're a couple of blocks from the most beautiful beaches. You can walk down there every morning. Um, beautiful, pristine white sand where the sun sets. We're, what, three blocks from there, four blocks? Yeah. You can just walk down. Um, so that's in December. End of January, we have a Caribbean cruise. And we did the, the um, Eastern Caribbean last time, Tim. And this time we will do the Western Caribbean. There's a few more stops. Um, I would be so delighted to see you there. We usually have quite a few Russian people. We do um, sometimes Russian translation, depends how many of them we have. Tim is the one to talk to, I believe, about that. And um, he will tell you exactly how to find out about it, OK? It's still actually. For the next few days, very inexpensive. Then usually in October, they push the price up. Um, do you have a co-facilitator for that, honey? Denise. Yes, Denise. I thought so. I just didn't want to um, speak it if it was wrong. Denise and Tim. And um, so that's the last week in January. We have a blast. If Sal was there, we have an even bigger blast. <laughs> I started with you before you even had the group cruises. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she's Alaska. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, so that is the last week in, in September. I believe in February we're doing a, a sexual, a sacred sexual retreat at a private island in Vietnam. Uh, wait a minute, that's in March. February, I believe we have a Russian group coming to my house. And um, 
I believe that's February. So in March we're due in Vietnam, and I believe in March. I am not sure. But we have got around there a Euro Mountain trip. We've got around that area, April, we have one of my favorite retreats, right here in Calgary. Our native family comes in from the reserve there, and it's uh, usually every April. I absolutely love it. If you can take an extra day or two, then our facilitators normally will arrange for a family member to drive into the Rockies. It is so beautiful. I love Red Deer. And I love Calgary, I love Alberta, actually. Um, so that's in April. We've got Belgium in, in around those days. Okay. In May, um, May we have Belgium. Do we? May is Belgium, thank you. Um, May is Belgium. And this year, um, in, in June, with the solstice, we're going to have a silent retreat in Greece. And Anastasia and Tim are the ones to speak about that, and they're so excited about it. And that's where we'll have a silent retreat. Now, on the way to Greece, we are stopping in Portugal. And my sister, my sister is the, the one to talk to you about that. We're a weekend in Lisbon. In Lisbon. It got outside Lisbon, actually. Okay. Yeah, we're determined. There are two places we're going to play. Let's find out. Yeah. We'll arrange a bath and ride and all of that. Yeah. Okay. So you can talk to her about it. So Lisbon and then on the way to Greece and then we go to Greece. It's going to be fun. Yeah. <laughs> and, and then after Greece, I believe um, I am going to um, Siberia. Currently, that's pretty. And then in July, we are in Ohio. And again, if you want to come for an extra day, they'll take you to the Serpent Mound, massive Serpent Mound, built by the ancient winged serpents, known as the Ashanta. And so um, that is in July, I think I have another day in July. In August, I have got Denmark, yes. and after Denmark, we again have Vietnam. And, and and again, we have the Euro Mountains. Then, no, we have pushed the Euro Mountains to September. In September, we will have a men and women's shamanic retreat, and it's at my house. And um, again, that's the one where we just give you um, the house. You can there's blow up mattresses, there's lots of quilts and pillows and things, and you can stay there if you wish. It's not included; it's just for you to use. And sometimes, you know, there's a lot, quite a few people that sort of sleep over. We usually get a separate house where our brothers and our sisters stay there. That's what we did this year. So in September, there's also Euro Mountains. In October, there's likely again to be Toronto. And there's a silent women's retreat every October. And we've never actually publicly publicized it because um, it, we try and keep the numbers small for that. But if you're interested in the silent women's retreat, it's just a small group of women in my home, and it's usually quite spectacular what was accomplished in that week. And then again in November, um, Russia. Then in December, Alan's house. <laughs> yeah, so my last, that's next year. And what I'd like to do is if we could have a container today, I just love playing games like this. If we can make a container today and you put your name in there, we will see who wins a free retreat. Oh. <laughs>
concept of the father wheel. 300, magical knowledge concept of the father wheel. Arcturian! <laughs> so let me go through the slope. So it says a lot of the blue. All known. The unknown. Three all known. The all known. No, all you and unknown. 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 Yes. Oh, how fascinating. Yes, I, it hit my heart. I see heart. clearly what is coming. Yes. Lot of work. I know. Alone. <laughs> <laughs> we have it. No, well, that's the devil. Oh, no, too. What do you mean? If there are three of them, you see, we've got the feminine and the masculine. Yes. I wonder if there's 300 neutral ones yes. for the inside. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Oh. <laughs> Okay, my loves. So um, I've got lots of fun things to tell you about the acupuncture points and the high heart and, and the trigger that I found. But let's begin, uh, let's begin by doing, first of all, our um, finding things that stir us in a way that is almost a little uncomfortable because you can't name it. See, the mind is used to labeling everything. Look, we have a basket. Fold your name over and put it in there, and I'll draw a free workshop for you. Okay? All right, my sweethearts, we'll just go into a meditation and remember these things in our life that stirred us within namelessly. Thanks. By the way, our cruise, we have. I said, okay, usually we have a free cruise, right? Sorry. We have a free cruise. Just carry on a second. So we usually give a free cruise away and pay people's airfare and everything and we give our classes and we have a cruise. So the whole thing is free. Last year somebody from South Africa won it. I had so much happiness achieved because of how glad she was. So this year I said, oh, we'll do another one. And then I went, okay, we'll do another one. <laughs> so we have three winners. And, and one is from Canada, actually from the Native Preserve. And one is from Russia. And one is oh, from, from Ohio, America. From, from Ohio. Yeah. And we interview her because we wanted to know how she manifested the miracle. Oh, really? We her. Yes. You know, the sad thing is now our person that won that cruise from Canada, I recently had a letter from her, you know, sometimes we don't realize that we're places are at war even when they're not. And she said, please, can the students pray for my family? And if you could do that as a tell for her, um, this is how our winner from the Native Reserve, the gangs are so bad on the reserve. And this is one of the best Native reservations in North America. They are the most wealthy. And um, the, the, they used to be called the Arena Reserve, now the Bear Tribe. Oh. But um, it's after the other yeah, Bear Tribe. Yes. Yeah. See, and, and it's a lady, and then their, their gangs there are so bad, and they're threatening her family. And she says, We feel like sitting ducks every night we go to sleep. Because they can come in at any moment. And um, so she said, Please, can people pray, pray for us? It's not safe for family anymore among their own people. How terrible. Yes, my love. This is in Red Alberta. Yes, sweetheart. Yeah. Yes. Do we need to know the name? Yes. Um, gosh, if you could find out the name for me, Tim. It's completely it is. Um, which, if we have the name, it would be definitely better than we can do carnation against the land. Okay, sweethearts. Yes, sir. Can you do the most of the people not knowing as well? Sorry? Just say again. We Blessing, it doesn't enforce me. And it hovers around them, and often it just deters others. And they, especially because she's asked for help, you know, but even if she hasn't, 
um, it is a blessing that you will either take or not, you know. Thank you, honey. Can we start over again? Doris Katmai. See 
you explaining the Merkaba, which is very cerebral, after what we've just experienced, um, I would like to sort of share with you some of the things that I was working on last night. Apparently, in the world around us, there are four layers of geometry. Um, the first layer being called projective geometry, and so on. There are four of them. And I, I have papers that I managed to get a year ago that's been in my briefcase waiting for today. Um, and I can, I'm happy to put them down on the table. And by the way, we won't do the drawing till after tea time, so you'll have plenty of time to put your name in the basket. But um, you can take a look, and perhaps you can understand it better than I did. But what I got from reading it is what I felt yesterday. There's four different layers of geometry to make constructs in our outer world. It looks to me that there are four inner methods of geometry as well. That these inner and outer combining to make a reality, because this is what we're aiming for, the spiritual maturity, to actually help create our realities. Now that we understand there's no right or wrong, now that we let go guilt or feeling unworthy to be in this role, now that we've done these things, which we've done over two days, to get our self-confidence to create our reality, there are four outer geometries, layer of geometries that I will explain to you, and apparently there are four inner geometries that must combine for inner um, ripples of inspiration to become outer articulated events. What prepares us to do this, first of all, is the purification of the eight meridians. The eight meridians are those pathways that allows the geometry to form between inner and outer reality. Now listen to how fascinating this is. Apparently, these four layers of geometry that mathematicians have been studying, they have there's two things that they have found, and that is that if you start with a cross, which has four points, and of course it has the crossover point, every additional layer of geometry eliminates one of those points by moving it inside. So let me give you an example. I believe it's the second layer of geometry gives the feeling of um, perpetual space, what, what did they call it, of infinity. It gives the feeling of infinity by taking one of the points and moving it into inner space. And it's done like this. Okay, so you've got um, you've got these four lines that make your cross with four points. If you took two of the lines and you make a V shape and you make them come together on a third one, on a third line, what you have is a road going across the horizon. See? And it implies that there's another point you're traveling to beyond the horizon. But now it's no longer in the geometry. It's an implied me metaphor, so to speak, an implied um, point. It has moved into inner space. With each of the layers of geometry, another point moves into inner space. Unless, uh, until eventually, there's only the middle point, the crossover point, there's only one point left with your fourth layer of geometry. One single point and the observer. They've also given, so bottom line of what I have just said is that as constructs take place, in our environment, which requires the four directions, four layers of geometry, and let's look where else we came up with the four in a moment, but as it takes shape, more and more is required of the viewer 
to assume certain things. For instance, to assume that if you have these two lines meeting at a third line, that it's a horizon. And that there is something, therefore, beyond the horizon. And for the first time, you realize there's an infinite possibility beyond the horizon. And OK, now you realize, wait a minute, the future, which is the only way that geometry is seen, it's seen as something, if you're constructing, it's something that's becoming. So it's a future. So the future has, therefore, endless possibilities. You can deduce that by the fact that you've now decided inside that there's something across that horizon that you can visually see. So let's backtrack. More and more is required of us to deduce as space becomes, as spatial constructions become more refined and more complex. More and more moves inward for the contribution to give that its form. So what we're saying is when the external becomes more and more complex by adding layers of geometry, the inside actually also becomes more and more involved in um, filling visual gaps. So it becomes a rounded, a well-rounded. Um, like you can see that this is just on a flat piece of paper, but hey, I can see this is a sphere. So this sphere is clearly visible to me, therefore um, I'm contributing something from the inside. It's the geometry is flat on the paper, but if we use Anastasia's words, it is in fact standing for something. And a metaphor is like the difference between a metaphor and a simile. A simile says the wind is like the eternal breath. Okay, it says something is like something. A metaphor is when you say the wind is the eternal black breath. So it's no longer like it, it represents it. I mean, I think you're calling something by the wrong name again because this was a real sense of concept. The metaphor? Oh, yeah. So it's something, it's that's something right. with the name, yeah. Yeah, that's right, it was your concept. Sorry about that. Okay, well, I will look for that. Yeah. So, my darlings, um, it, when I do that in class, it's usually because something's been misnamed. So, I will look for that. Or something's been given the wrong origin. Mm -hmm. So, in other words, we've got four layers of geometry. Let's look at it in, in how I discuss it in Journey to the Heart of God. I describe how the big spatial torus was made that we've been using as our external construct, going into it with great discomfort at times, into this, this um, binding construct, which becomes like a matrix. How it was made is that awareness moved in four ways. And I trace this because novels before me had only traced two of the movements. They had traced the feminine movement of spiraling, and they had traced the outward movement. But they did not put together that the outward movement, which is spiraling, but moving outward, two layers of geometry combined, outward moving radiating line with a spiraling line, um, he didn't take into consideration that it was also arcing to make it to Taurus and us to arc. And I could see that by looking between two mirrors, that the images of myself seems to go into infinity, but it isn't in fact doing that. It's arcing, which means at some point it has to come back. And so I realized there was this third movement of the arcing. And then I realized that the cosmos was on a disk inside the donut. So the cosmos was moving through 300 cycles of, uh, of its days, if you will, in its orbit. Well, what it is is 300 coils inside the, um, the tube torus. The movement of the cosmos within is responsible for the fourth layer that happened, and it is that it starts to arc. It arcs. 
So it goes like this. See? Like this. Which in some way that I cannot explain to you is a form of Mobius movement. And Mobius is one of the layers of the um, of the um, geometry. My last, I can't deviate too much because otherwise I'm going to use what I'm saying. But why don't you go know, and then. This is about the, that movement that you're speaking uh -huh. of. It's in the Arasat or the seven breath that we just did. Uh -huh. And that go, comes back to the point. So it goes arcing up to yes. the body and comes back in again through the pranic tube. From the yes. So I don't know. It's the donut. So this is what It is the donut. 